to today's broadcast of North Idaho College Public Forum. The crew is comprised of NIC television students and your moderator is North Idaho College political scientist Tony Stewart. Today we wish to discuss with you the live theater and we want to talk about playwriting and all those important uh, issues that so many of you have enjoyed over the years. I think one of the greatest entertainments is the live theater. In order to accomplish our goal of discussing this topic, we're happy to welcome one of my colleagues from North Idaho College who's uh, very outstanding in the field, Mr. Tim Rarick. Uh, our guest holds a BA degree from the University of Idaho, received in 1968. He also received a master's degree from the University of Oregon in 1975, and then he went back to that institution for one year as a teaching fellow. Uh, he is a writer, and he is also the director of the drama uh, program at North Idaho College. Tim, welcome to the program. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. It's nice to be here. And as always, I'm very happy to have on the panel uh, Janelle Burke, who is an Idaho attorney, and we shall ask Janelle to commence the questioning. Tim, you're a modern playwright. Can you tell us the history, of what you've written, and kind of when you started, a little bit about some of the plays that you've written? Um, 1979 was, was the first play that I produced, and uh, I came back to Coeur d'Alene to write it. It was called Danced on Silver. It was a musical, and it was based on regional history. Um, I did that one in 79, and then in 1980, one called Bull of the Woods. The first one was about, essentially, the uh, discovery of silver in the North Idaho area. The second one had to do with the logging boom at the turn of the century. And then um, after that one, one called 1706 Front, which was in the Depression era, 1930s, and was based on uh, a lot of stories that I got from uh, my aunts and uh, my family, because it was about my father's family in the 1930s. And, and it was set here in Coeur d'Alene. It was set here in Coeur d'Alene. Um, they lived at 1706 Front Street or Avenue, and, uh, and that house still exists. Um, then there was one on Noah Kellogg that followed that. Um, it was a, um, a kind of a, a personality profile, musical personality profile of Noah Kellogg. And then one on Mae Hutton, uh, who was uh, one of the first woman uh, uh, suffragettes um, and helped win the right to vote for the women of Idaho and Washington. Let's see what else. Um, most recently, uh, I did one on the Lewis and Clark expedition that was performed here at North Idaho College. Um, and about what, what a month is the ago. name of that one? It's called River Song, and it's it, it focuses on the uh, relationship between William Clark and Meriwether Lewis, and about the circumstances of Lewis's death. Now, most of these plays have been historical, at least in setting. And how do you go about researching some of the background for those plays? Well, that's, that's really a fun part of it. I really enjoy that part of it a lot. And I've, I've even thought about, <coughs> of course, occasionally not doing uh, historically oriented material, but I've discovered I like to do the research so much that it's hard to stay away from it. Um, I spend an awful lot of time in libraries. I, uh, I spent a lot of time at the University of Washington, the Northwest Collection, the Northwest Library they have there. For the ones that were more recent, I was able to talk to people, and that's been a fun part of it. Uh, we were commissioned by Tom Cooper, has written the music for a lot of the shows that, that I have worked on, and uh, uh, he and I have gone to different places to interview people who have firsthand recollections of, of early times around Coeur d'Alene. We were commissioned by the Sunshine Mining Company to do um, uh, a musical based on their history for their centennial celebration, which was like in 70, 86 or 87, I'm not sure which now. And um, because a lot of their history is fairly recent, we were able to find people who had very clear recollections of, of uh, the development of that mine. So th there's a lot of people involved, old newspapers, a lot of libraries. And you do some research, and I, I would expect some traveling, too. Quite a bit. To, to go look at things. Well, for actually. instance, for the um, Lewis and Clark piece, we started in St. Louis and followed the, the route to the Pacific Ocean and stopped at every conceivable place along the way that, uh, uh, that had any um, interest in terms of museums and, and uh, landmarks. And so, yeah, it's a good excuse to take car trips occasionally. Now, I take it that you write basically the prose, is I do, that correct? I do the words, and, and Tom does the music, uh, but uh, it's not that simple, really. And in fact, uh, I've tried to discover a way for a long time 
that I could explain what that relationship is. And as corny as it sounds, I think it's like a couple of guys going out with some axes and chopping up uh, some wood. And you stack it together, and you have a cord of wood, and it's real hard to determine who put what where. You just have the finished product at the end. So he, he makes a lot of contributions to the text. And in some ways, although I'm not a musician, I uh, make a lot of contributions to the music. It, it really is braided together uh, and, and moves forward in that manner. It's not as simple as one writes the words and one does the music. Now, you've talked a little bit about your research. How do you, as a writer, decide when to leave the facts and begin to embroider? Well, actually, that... To bring life into the, yeah, into right. the play. There is, there is some license, you know. And, and first of all, um, I'm a playwright. And so that always is the most important thing. And um, although I wouldn't deal with the history if I felt like I had to, to change it so much that it distorted it. So what I'm looking for is, is to compress and condense more than anything else. For instance, a, a good example would be in, the, in the, the musical we did on Mae Hutton. We, had, we chose two days in her life, you know, one at the turn of the century, right around 1900, another one about 1915. And since the play was just those two days, we had to pack more into each of those two days than than actually happened on those two days. But none of it distorted her or the history. It, we just took a little dramatic license there in order to make sure we got the elements that we needed for the drama. So playwright first, historian second, if you had to rank them. Uh, and for our viewing audience, would you please identify May Arkwright Hutton in a little more detail? She is uh, also the person who is responsible for Hutton Settlement. Yes, she's uh, a wonderful Hutton Building in Spokane. Woman. I, I read a book about her called uh, A Liberated Woman, and I read it years ago and, and thought at the time that she was an excellent character for a musical. She was a, 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 a very imposing woman. She w weighed about 300 pounds. She had absolutely no... Um, there, there was no one that ever intimidated May Hutton. It was quite the opposite. She came to the Coeur d'Alene's as a, as a penniless uh, cook camp up in the mining district. And uh, by saving a little money here and there, um, she was able to invest in a mine that turned out to be the Hercules. And she became a millionaire. And, but even before she got all of her money, she was interested in a lot of causes, a lot of social causes. Um, the women's right to vote was, was one that she gave a lot of time to. She was involved in all the labor disputes up in the Coeur d'Alene's in the 1890s and early 1900s. She was uh, an outspoken woman. She was the first representative, uh, first woman's representative to the Democratic National Convention. She was friend of William Jennings Bryant and, and, and Theodore Roosevelt. She was a very exciting woman. And so she made an excellent topic for a play. Oh, yeah, a perfect, perfect musical vehicle, you know. <clears throat> As someone who is not a playwright myself, and but someone who really enjoys the live theater, I, I have a real curiosity about how your mind works because when one is not involved in, in, in a certain aspect of life, I think there's a lot of curiosity. You're a very, very talented person and your productions have been excellent. But <clears throat> I, I'm going along with some of the comments that, uh, or questions that Janelle had. When you do all this research, and there's got to be such a large amount of data uh, from the history, I've been sitting here and was curious about as she walked through all of that, and in case of uh, Hutton, where you took just two days, wh at what point or in, in what process do you go through uh, that documentation to decide what path you're going to take? It, it must be a real challenge because there's so many different ways that you could go. It, it, that's true, and, and there, is no, there is no formula for that. It, it, it's, it's very strange how, how that occurs. I wish there was a formula, you know, uh, in some ways. Sometimes it's, it's the person themselves, and they have a certain characteristic. Uh, uh, in the case of Mae Hutton, she was a very dynamic person, and she had very uh, strong opinions, and she had very definite goals that she wanted to achieve. And, and since the dramatic form requires that you have a, a character who wants something badly and is willing to, to overcome a lot of obstacles in order to achieve it, her character fairly well defined what I wanted to follow, and it was a matter of finding out which of, of her crusades I wanted to, to tap into. Uh, but in some other cases, it was, it's not a person. Uh, it might be a place or a time that is interesting to me. The Depression has always been an, a very interesting time for me and uh, to study, because I heard so many stories about it and heard them firsthand from my father. And so 1706 became an attempt uh, 
to capture the essence of a, of a time and a place more than any particular character. Um, and on other occasions, it might be an, uh, an event. Um, so there really isn't any path. It's which one of those becomes the area that you want to focus on. And then from that, if it's an event, then you pull in people to people that event or to people that place, you know. But I would imagine at some point as you're doing that research, something hits you, that something gets your attention of saying, this is the way I want to proceed with this. It play. does, and, and those are real nice moments because sometimes it'll be uh, weeks and, and sometimes months before, and you just, you're piling up a lot of information and a lot of, of pages of dialogue and you're not sure what it is. But then something will happen, and it'll happen in, in the weirdest times, in the weirdest places, and, and a lot of the things that you've been working with will make sense, and you'll start to see a through line, and, and that's wonderful. I mean, that feels real good <laughs> when that occurs, because sometimes you wonder if it'll happen. You know? I would like to cross over to that other side of where you're involved in directing and uh, producing uh, what has been written. Uh, we know that there are a number of people who have worked in the theater and they also wor work in motion pictures and others keep that separate. Uh, after many years of experience, do you think that, that most uh, actors and actresses are better in one area or another one or are some people equally gifted? In other words, I, I guess I'm asking you to give some commentary on uh, how does one choose where they would be good, at, whether they be good in the theater mm -hmm. or in motion pictures? Because there's, there's remarkable differences in how you go about a production for each, I'm sure. Yeah, I, I, don't, I, I don't know about that. I, I, I know that, that most uh, actors, if they had their choice, and if they had any experience on the stage, uh, go back there. Um, uh, and it's because of the, of the live nature that you were, of it, that you were talking about at the beginning of, the, of this show. Um, that is an irreplaceable thing, and, and that immediate feedback that you get from the audience is, is so wonderful. It's a very electric kind of feeling, and, uh, and it, is, it is ancient theater. It is the basis of what theater is, the exchange between audience and actor. Um, I if you're asking if, if someone is a better actor for the movies or for the stage, I, I don't know that. I, I, think, I think that uh, in terms of skills, that um, there's more demand in terms of a person's talent and skills for the stage than there is for film, but I'm sure somebody could argue that other half uh, very well. But, but isn't the, <clears throat> when you're doing film and you're having a lot of retakes and there's certain magical things that you can do with film and cutting and editing. Yeah, that, but see, that I, I know so little about that. I, yeah. um, I, I wouldn't feel like I could comment on that. I don't have any experience with that, or very little of it. Janelle Bird. Tim, you're a teacher of drama, mm -hmm. and my own, music, my own background is a musical background. Uh, I know that certain composers have written things because they knew someone. It was a medium to allow them to express that other person's talent. Uh, what about when you're, when you're writing a play? Do you have someone in mind sometimes that you think is going to serve as the actor or the actress for a particular part? And the second part of my question is, do you consider the abilities of people when you're writing, who do you think is going to be, who are, who are going to be the performers in this, mm. in this play? That's a good question. And, and, <laughs> and how capable are they going to be? You know, uh -huh. it, it sometimes strikes me that uh, the person who writes could be miles above or miles below the people who are eventually yeah. going to be performing. Well, well, the first part of that is, is fairly easy. Uh, when I am constructing a play, I always, um, I always plug in uh, something visual. And, and so it may be somebody I know, or it may be a movie star or an actor, but I do give somebody a, 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 a physical nature in, in, in my head so that what, what it becomes is, is like a movie that's going on in there. Um, and I do shot after shot after shot. But yes, I do plug in somebody. Um, so when you're thinking of a little kid, it might be someone like your little boy. I exactly, and, uh -huh. and that's been the case on, on, on a couple of occasions. And if I knew that the play was going to be produced here, and I knew I was going to cast it here, then um, you know I would go through people that I've worked with in the past and, and think in terms of, of them. Um, but that also that, that's not such a good thing either. And, and they're one of the reasons that I, I moved to Seattle for um, well, I spent three years there, 
to write River Song was because once you start doing that, um, and even if you stay and realize that, that what, what, you're going to, what you're writing is going to be produced in Coeur d'Alene, then, um, then you also start limiting it to the people that you know, the parts that you can cast, and it, it kind of limits your imagination as well. So I think it's real healthy for a writer, whether it be theater or what else, to go to a strange environment and work in a different environment just so that you open those doors up again, you know, and anything becomes, becomes possible. Because either subconscious, consciously or subconsciously you begin to write for a particular audience or with the limitations of a particular budget or for a particular stage, and, and that can be kind of stifling, you know. And that's part of the, the second part of the question is how do you decide how difficult you're going to make this work? Who do you perceive is going to perform it in the future? Yeah. And how do you make it universal, I guess, is the, is the question. Well, um, I just I try to make it as difficult as I possibly can, you know. I, I always, I know that there are um, very, very talented performers out there that are going to be able to handle anything I can write. So I'm going to write the very best I can and then hope to then go about the business of finding. I don't. I wouldn't know any other way to to do that. <coughs> Casting has got to be another challenge, and that's uh, part of what Janelle is dealing with. But I, I'm sure you have in your your mind that there are certain requirements that's going to be uh, there for a particular role. Mm -hmm. And let us suppose you ha you have the luxury of having a lot to choose from, particularly in large urban areas. Well, again, I, I guess part of this is instinct or from learning over a period of time, but how do you know that you've chosen the right person for that part? <laughs> you don't. <laughs> uh, there are, a, a director sits down before auditions and lists an, a bunch of absolutes, you know, things that he wants, that this character must have. Uh, it may be something in terms of their uh, uh, physical appearance, it may be there, something in terms of their voice. Um, but generally, it's something much more elusive than that. It's a certain quality that, um, that shows up in an audition, and you hear it, and, and, and it seems right. So as much preparation as you can do in terms of listing all the things that you want, generally what happens at auditions is that some, someone reads something or moves or reacts in such a way that you see that they have a quality that's very similar to a key quality in the character and you think well if I can make that bond then we can develop the character around it so you're usually looking for something that that uh, I suppose this sounds a little goofy but uh, you're looking for something that says uh, that that there is a tie between that actress and that character and that's usually something you can't teach mm -hmm. you know they either have it or they don't now, in the educational theater it's a little different you know I don't really approach it that way for shows that we do here at, at NIC, um, that's a whole different thing. I don't know if you want to get into that or not. Yes, <clears throat> I, I'd like to move on to another area, just uh, might get back to that, but I was at a performance once, and this was in the musical field. It wasn't um, the theater, and there was something happened, a chemistry between the performer that evening and the audience, and it was so electrifying that at the intermission, something unusual happened. The entertainer came to the front of the stage and said, uh, I am not taking an intermission because I have never had an audience any better than this. And so he, he inserted some more uh, numbers and it was over two and a half hours of a very special relationship. I'm sure that happens in the theater too. Uh, I, this may be an impossible question, but I still must ask it. And that is, what makes sometimes uh, in both a play or in a musical uh, production that chemistry, or from night to night, audiences are very different. But that is an impossible question. It is true, and we talk that about that a lot with, with actresses and actors. Um, the theater experience is complete when the audience shows up, and there really is no theater until that happens. So what, a what actors and actresses learn is, um, is that an audience has a group personality, and it changes every night, and, and the composition of the audience changes, and, and some nights, the group personality of the audience uh, reacts so positively to what's happening on the stage that it becomes a constant feed back and forth between the two of them. And, and, um, and in times when I've been performing and, and you feel that, it's, it's, a, it's a very exciting 
experience. And there's other times when the audience may be very uh, interested and in, in enjoying very much what you're doing, but they're not providing any feedback, and so you feel like there's this, this wall that exists between you and them. I don't know what that is. I try to, to get audiences to be active and talk to students about being an active audience and going to a, a live production with a sense of responsibility instead of just being passive. Mm -hmm. To go and, and feed, give some feedback to the, to the actors and, and, and go prepared to listen and play a role in, in the production. You know? It's, it's got to be a great uh, experience on that evening when that happens. That, that oh, yeah. That's what would keep one in the theater. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Janelle. Following along that same line, now I have <coughs> another line of questioning, but, but following along that same line, do you think that the expectation of perfection that we have because we watch movies where everything is perfect, there's not a blemish uh, in terms of the actors and the actresses and the way they perform their lines, do you think that's a drawback then to live theater when people go and they watch, they sometimes uh, are critical because everything isn't as perfect as it is uh. where the retakes occur? Well, I, I'm, that's something that, that we, we have to compete with, but that's, that's wonderful competition. I mean, our, our whole purpose is to, uh, is to do it without blemish as well. Um, I, I suppose there's, there's that challenge, but that's, that's, a welcome, that's a welcome one. My, my second line of questioning really has to do with style. As you're, you are, um, a, as a playwright, do you find that you have a particular style to which you are directed. Some people will be avant-garde, some people will be different. Uh, and do you find that you change style and you have, you've, your style has evolved as you've been writing? Well, th in this last production, that was certainly true. Uh, I, yeah, I can see, as I look back now, uh, certain shows that, uh, well, let me, let me say this, that the we, we, when I say we, I'm talking about Tom Cooper and myself because we've worked together for for quite a long time. The first two shows I, I did with another composer. And they, stylistically, were, were traditional book musicals. Uh, and um, song, dance, dialogue, song. Um, Bruce wanted to continue to do that. And, and I really wasn't interested in doing that. I was interested in more moving towards a, a musical play as opposed to musical comedy. And ultimately towards uh, an opera. And that's really what, what Tom and I have done. Uh, is is each show we have tried to to incorporate uh, more of the musical aspect of telling the story and less of the dialogue mode and River Song is kind of a culmination of about six years of of work in that direction um, about ninety five percent of that is sung and it is indeed a contemporary opera and so our style has always been pointing that way but it's taken us a little bit uh, to get there, and it's and it has it's been more uh, non-realistic. Our style is, has grown towards non-realism as opposed to realism. You certainly must have some favorites, some favorite scenes or some favorite songs. Why are those favorites? Which ones are they, and why are they favorites? Uh, <laughs> Might be a little difficult to it, think it about is, that but, right now. But um, I was telling somebody the other day that there was there was a favorite song in in, in River Song was a song that was written in about two hours, which is uh, unheard very of. Very short. It is, very, very short time. Now, I thought about it for about three months before it happened, but I remember where I was and what I was doing. I, I was driving in the Northwest Cascades and stopped, and, 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 um, and I, was, I was so excited about finally getting it out and uh, that I've always enjoyed it. And the guy who sang it uh, for the Seattle production, had a beautiful voice, and, and the, all the elements came together. Other songs are labored over for months and months and months and, and constantly changed. And uh, that doesn't mean they can't evolve to be a favorite, but I, I guess maybe some of them are favorites because of the circumstances under which they finally emerge. And, and that one sticks out because it was unexpected. It happened very quickly. It was a great release because I had been working, thinking about it for a long time. And then somebody with a beautiful voice sang it. So, and what do you think we can do to encourage more people to do play writing like you're doing? Uh, uh, would uh, subsidies help of some type, and would uh, or, or some kinds of grants, that type of thing? Can can those uh, sources be helps to keeping people in yeah, the play writing? Yeah, they sure can. And, and other another real good way to do it is is uh, for theaters to be a little more risk taking. You know. Um, they are, they're plagued by the problem of having to make money 
and in order to do that they they think they have to do shows that everybody knows the name of uh, they have to do hello dolly for the fifteenth hundred time you know um, if, if if there were more theaters out there that were willing to do a little risk taking and i think colleges ought to do a little bit of that myself that would encourage people because the most encouraging thing for a playwright is to see his work up and if he if you never get to that point mm -hmm you never really see your work because it's not a play until it's performed. It's only on the page. My question ties right into that. If you are selecting a, a play for Coeur d'Alene and then one for Seattle and Portland in, in different locations, are there some factors that are different that you uh, helps you determine uh, what your selection would be? I, mean, I would assume audiences are very different in different locations. Well, you know, not as much as you think. <laughs> I think I thought that too. I, rem I, I remember a time when I thought that was true, but, but the fact is that the audience that saw uh, River Song in Seattle um, had by and large the, the same reaction. Uh, I heard the same kind of comments about it. I observed the same kinds of behavior while watching the audience watch the play. Um, it, it's not terribly, terribly different. Um, I suppose uh, in metropolitan New York, as one critic talked about in terms of our show, that's a rarefied atmosphere. Um, the expectation might be a little bit greater, and there may be uh, some more sophistication, some more, but, but by and large, uh, they're the same, you know, same people. Uh, when you mention New York, I, I suppose you're talking about the fact that with all the productions they have and they become quite sophisticated, so there it might be more of a challenge. Yes, um, there, there seems to be a, a great demand there right now for spectacle. Um, there are certain things that work in New York very, very well now, and, and one of them is spectacle, opulence, and, and uh, that's not the, the area that, that Tom and I want to go into, and in fact we're more intrigued by uh, keeping, it, keeping things as simple as possible and exploring uh, people's motives as opposed to uh, millions of dollars of, of uh, scenery and, and uh, special effects. With that, I have to bring the program to conclusion. Uh, we're out of time, but Tim, on behalf of Janelle and our staff, we want to thank you. It's been just so informative and enlightening, and uh, we've enjoyed it very much, and I know our audience has. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you've enjoyed our program with Tim Rarick, who is, uh, heads the Department of Drama at North Idaho College and is a playwright. Uh, we've been talking about the theater and also uh, a playwright uh, work. We hope you'll be with us again next week at the same time. Until then, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. North Idaho College Public Forum can be seen at the same time each week over this station. This production was videotaped earlier by an NIC student crew for viewing at this more appropriate time.